Are you ready for Valentine's Day? You thought I was going to say something else, didn't you? Is there anything else more important going on this week? I just heard the other day, Valentine's Day is Tuesday. I'm not ready, but I'll tell you, the greeting card industry is ready. I've been told, I don't know this from personal experience, but I've been told that a greeting card for a Valentine's Day goes for about $8 now. Now, before you accuse me of being cheap, let me argue that there are other ways for us to express our love for the people in our lives who matter most to us, whether we're talking about our spouses, our parents, our children, or even very close friends. And today, we're continuing to do that for the whole month of February in our series that we call Fall in Love with the Holy Spirit. Last week, Greg kicked us off, and the first thing he told us was that the first two messages of this series, that the application was going to be learning, as we continue that today. And last week, Greg got us started by asking a simple question. He said, who is the Holy Spirit? And the answer to that is surprisingly simple to say. The Holy Spirit is God. He is God. He is the third member of the Trinity, and he has personhood. Now, that's easy to say, but I'll tell you, it's a lot harder to understand. In fact, I think it's impossible to completely understand. I'm okay with that. Because the God that I have fallen in love with, the God that I want to worship, has to be more holy, more amazing than I could possibly imagine in my tiny human intellect. So today we're going to continue with this education that we're doing. We're going to do it by asking another simple question. What did the Holy Spirit do? And to do that, we're going to do a survey through Scripture. We're looking for examples of the Holy Spirit doing his work. And we're going to learn the, uh, the ways that he does that. To help us, we have on the back of your bulletin an outline. And if you look at that outline, you'll see right at the top, What did the Holy Spirit do? And then you'll see there are seven statements. Those seven statements help describe the work of the Holy Spirit. And uh, they came directly from Dr. Jack Cottrell's great book, Faith Once for All, same book that Greg referred to last week. Dr. Cottrell is also the author of the Holy Spirit book that we're using in our small group studies, our life group studies throughout this series. And Linda asked me to let you know that if you're still looking for a copy of this book, that we have managed to buy every copy in the known world. (laughs) It is fortunately still available on Amazon. You can download the e-book so that you can participate as you go along with us. So now I think we're ready to just get started. And we're going to start just by with our outline. I'm going to help you out a little bit here. I think you should do more than just fill in the blanks on this. You'll help yourself a lot if you'll also write down the names of the people we're talking about and the scriptures that we're referring to. Those scriptures will help you when you go home to look more carefully at these uh, events that I'm going to describe in scripture because we're going to go through them pretty fast. This is going to be a lot like last week. We're going to be in six different books of the Bible as we look for these seven ways that the Holy Spirit works. So come along with me. We'll start with the first one. It's the simplest one. It says the Holy Spirit, he only came upon some people. This is the easiest one to explain. In Scripture, in the Old Testament, I can tell you the time period covered in that history is about 4,000 years, roughly. And in 4,000 of years, 4,000 years, Millions of people lived on this earth. In Scripture, in the Old Testament, 
are listed about 3,000 individual people by name. Most of them are God's chosen people, the Israelites. These are the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. So when we talk today about God's chosen people, we're talking about God's chosen people in the Old Testament, the people of Israel. Out of those 3,000 names, compared to those 3,000 names, the Holy Spirit's mentioned about 75 times in the Old Testament. And so those numbers alone show us very clearly that the Holy Spirit did not come upon very many people. So that takes care of the first one pretty easily. We're going to go right on to the second one. It says that he equipped people for service to be instruments to accomplish God's will. For that one, we're going to go right to Scripture. So if you'll open up with me to Exodus chapter 31, that's where we're going to start. While you're on your way to Exodus chapter 31, we're going to start and write in verse 1. Let me give you some context. Exodus. The people, God's chosen people, the Israelites, God has brought them up out of Egypt, as he often says, out of slavery. They're on their way to the promised land, but they're not there yet. But so far, they have received the Ten Commandments, and after God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, God continues to instruct Moses about the things that they would need to worship God, the objects that they would need in the tabernacle. And these are amazingly beautiful, designed out of precious metals and gemstones. And in the process of doing this, God introduces to Moses a man named Betz Alael. Let's read just a little bit about him. Chapter 31 of Exodus in the first verse. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, See, I have called by name Betz Alael, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship, to design artistic works, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting jewels, for setting, in carving wood, and to work in all manner of workmanship. Isn't that a simple explanation right here? The Holy Spirit in Scripture very often comes down on leaders and prophets, but this is an example where the Holy Spirit came upon ordinary, an ordinary man and took what skills he had and made them extraordinary so that he would be equipped to do for God what God had planned for his people. Now we've got two of the seven already done. For the next one, we need to go forward in history. Oh, just a few years. We're in Exodus, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers. We need to go to Numbers chapter 24. And while you're there, I'll update you. The people of Israel are still on the road, on their way to the promised land. They've worked their way out of the Sinai Peninsula, out of the desert. They are east of the Jordan River. When they cross the Jordan River, they'll be in the promised land. The land east of the Jordan River is a place called Moab, the land of the Moabites. Among the Moabites Moabites is a man named Balak. Balak is concerned about this because millions of Israelites have showed up in his country and he's heard that they have basically fought their way from Egypt all the way to Moab. He needs a plan, right? Well, here's his plan. He knows about a famous prophet by the name of Balaam. He's going to send for Balaam, bring Balaam there. He's going to pay Balaam to curse the people of Israel. Sound like a good plan? That's what he thinks. So he sends messengers to Balaam. The messengers eventually convince Balaam to come. And when Balaam comes, he warns Balak. He says, this prophecy thing is not what you really think it is. You can't just order up a prophecy. If I prophesy, I have to say exactly what God tells me to say. Well, Balak's desperate, so he agrees to this. So they set up their sacrifices. They go up on top of the hill. They're overlooking all the tribes of Israel. If we go to Numbers chapter 24, starting in verse 2, we can see what happens. 
And Balaam raised his eyes and saw Israel encamped according to their tribes, and the Spirit of God came upon him. Then he took up his oracle. An oracle is just his discourse. He began to speak. He took up his oracle and said, The utterance of Balaam, the son of Beor, the utterance of the man whose eyes are open, the utterance of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, O dwellings, O Israel, your dwellings, O Israel, like valleys that stretch out like gardens by the riverside, like aloes planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the waters. This is not what Balak wanted. He asked for a curse, and instead Balaam has blessed the people of Israel. In fact, the part I just read to you is the third time. They tried three times to do this. Every time Balaam blesses the people of Israel. Now, you're probably not surprised by that, right? The scripture says the spirit of the Lord came upon him. So, of course, he prophesied exactly what God wanted him to say. But the surprising thing is that Balaam is not one of the people of God, one of the chosen people of God. Scripture tells us that he's from a place called Pethor, which is way over by the Euphrates River. It's hundreds of miles away. He's a pagan. He's not part of the people of Israel. His ancestors didn't go to Egypt with uh, Jacob. He wasn't part of the 12 tribes. And so what we have here is an illustration of the third point we have, the third statement in our outline that the Holy Spirit used some people who were not of God's chosen people. All right, for the next four statements, we're going to go to the same place in Scripture. We have to go ahead in history now, about 400 years. You have to work your way all the way to the book of Samuel, which isn't that far away. From where we are in Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, Samuel. We're going to be in chapter 10 of Samuel. The people are now in the promised land. People of God are in the promised land. They've been there for quite a while now. And things aren't going all that well. The people there don't like them being there. There's constant fighting, constant wars. And the people of Israel are getting the short end of it. See, God has intended them to live there directly living for him under the leadership of what are called the judges. But if things aren't going well, the people are complaining, and what they've decided is they want a king. All the other countries around them have a king. They don't know why they don't have a king. If we had a king, things would be going better. They ask God for a king. What do we say all the time here? Sometimes God gives us exactly what we ask for. So God gives the people of Israel a king. His choice is a bit of a surprising choice because God doesn't go to the tribe of Judah. The tribe of Judah is the tribe of Israel that will have all of the rest of the legitimate kings of Israel. Instead, he goes to an obscure family in the smallest tribe of Israel, Benjamin. He chooses a man named Saul to be the first king. Now Saul looks the part. Scripture tells us he's a head taller than everybody else, and he's extremely handsome. That's good material to work with for a king. So Samuel, the prophet, at God's direction, anoints Saul, and he tells Saul, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you will prophesy. So let's pick up in Scripture, 1 Samuel chapter 10, in verse 10. This is going to describe what happens. When they came, that's uh, Samuel and Saul, when they came there to the hill, there was a group of prophets to meet them, and the Spirit of God came upon him, came upon Saul, and he prophesied among them. And it happened when all those who knew him formerly saw that he indeed prophesied among the prophets, that the people said to one another, What is this that has come upon the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? See, the people who knew him best 
were surprised. In fact, they mocked him. What's Saul? He's like a prophet now? But what they don't understand is that when the Holy Spirit comes upon someone in the Old Testament, it is sometimes accompanied by a sign. And that's our next point in our outline. The number three point, he used, some, um, number four, he sometimes gave a sign. And the sign's purpose is the same as it is throughout Scripture. It's to authenticate that person's calling. So Saul is to be the king of Israel now. The next thing that happens is that Samuel needs to present him to the whole nation. He gathers all 12 tribes of Israel. And out of the 12 tribes, he calls out the tribe of Benjamin. They step forward. And out of the tribe of Benjamin, he calls out the family of Matri. They step forward. And then he calls out Saul. But Saul's nowhere to be found. They look all around. They can't find him. Samuel has to consult God again, and God says he's hiding in the baggage. Not a very auspicious start for the first king of Israel, is it? Well, to see what's going on, notice that in the last verse of chapter 10, that there were some, that some rebels said, how can this man save us? So they despised him. And brought him no presence. But he, Saul, held his peace. Now the ne very next thing that happens in chapter 11. Shows us the power of the Holy Spirit upon someone. Because Saul then gathers an army of 300,000 warriors. And he saves the people of a place called Yabesh Gilead. A city there in the area that's being beset by an army of Ammonites. Now Saul's army kills most of the Ammonite soldiers and scatters most of the rest. And in the aftermath of that battle, as everyone is celebrating the victory, look in chapter 11, verse 12. Listen to what the people are saying. Then the people said to Samuel, who is he who said, shall Saul reign over us? They're looking for those guys. Bring them in that we may put them to death. But Saul said, Not a man shall be put to death this day. For today the Lord has accomplished salvation in Israel. He saved the country of Israel. This is not the same Saul, obviously, who was hiding in the baggage a short time before. The Spirit of God has equipped him to do his part in God's plan. And it's not for the benefit of Saul, which is our fifth point. The Holy Spirit came upon them for the benefit of God's people. Saul is, the Holy Spirit's not upon him. It doesn't necessarily improve him morally or spiritually. In fact, things don't really end well for Saul those of you that know the story. If we go forward again in history just a short time, just a few pages to 1 Samuel chapter 16, Saul has been disobedient to God. And in his disobedience, his mentor Samuel has deserted him, and God no longer supports him as king of Israel. In fact, God has sent Samuel to find the next king of Israel, David. And in verse 13 of chapter 16, Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. That's David. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. There's the point number six in our outline. You can see that sometimes the Holy Spirit sometimes came upon people with an anointing or with a laying on of hands. And then in the very next verse, verse 14, we find out, but the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. 
That's the last point on our outline, point number seven. The Holy Spirit stayed only as long as the need for the person's service remained. Now, we need to do a quick review here. We've learned that the Holy Spirit only came upon some people. He equipped people for service, to be instruments to accomplish God's will. He used some people who were not God's chosen people. He sometimes gave a sign to authenticate a person's calling. He came upon them for the benefit of God's people. He sometimes came upon people with an anointing or laying on of hands. And he stayed only as long as the need for the person's service remained. Now, when we started designing this series, originally this message was going to be all about the Holy Spirit's work in the Old Testament. And the follow-on next week would be the Holy Spirit's work in the New Testament. But as we studied, we began to wonder, and I began to wonder, is the Old Testament, New Testament line really the dividing place between the work of the Holy Spirit in the past and the way the Holy Spirit works now? It's easy to find out. All we have to do is go look somewhere in the New Testament, find the Holy Spirit at work, and see if it's like it is in the Old Testament. So go with me to Luke chapter 1. New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, the third gospel. Luke chapter 1 covers the period of time just before Jesus was born. Here's what's happening. The angel Gabriel comes to a man named Zacharias. Your Bible may say Zachariah, just a different spelling of the same name. Don't confuse him with the Old Testament prop, prophet Zacharias, Zacharias, two different guys. Zacharias in the New Testament, Luke chapter 1, is a priest. He's not from Jerusalem. He's an old guy. He's from a small town south of Jerusalem. He's in Jerusalem for his annual once-a-year service in the temple. While he's there, the angel Gabriel comes to him and says, you're going to have a son. This is sort of a familiar theme in the Bible. He doesn't have any kids. He's old. Angel Gabriel says, you're going to have a son. And Zacharias has a hard time believing this. In any case, listen to what the angel says to him. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He, was also, he will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. Who is he talking about here? John the Baptist. This is the announcement that John the Baptist will be born. The Holy Spirit is upon him even before he's born. God has just chosen John the Baptist to be the one who announces the coming of our Savior. Does this sound like Old Testament Holy Spirit? John the Baptist has a specific purpose in God's plan. This all sounds just the same. If we go just a little further in chapter 1, we can see that the Holy Spirit appears again. First, the angel Gabriel, again, he comes to Mary comes to Mary to tell her that she is going to have a child. Mary's more than a little puzzled by this. Listen to what she says to the angel. Verse 34 of chapter 1 in Luke. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Does this sound like the Old Testament Holy Spirit's work? The Holy Spirit will conceive in Mary and prepare her to do her part in God's plan to bear our Savior for a specific purpose. Still sounds the same, doesn't it? In fact, even in chapter 1, there are two more instances that are just sound the same. But let's look at one more, go a little further in Scripture. We'll go forward in history about another 30 years, but we actually have to back up a few pages because I'm going to go to Mark chapter 1. In Mark chapter 1, 
30 years later, Jesus is now coming to the River Jordan to be baptized by John the Baptist. Listen to what it says. It came to pass in those days that Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the spirit descending upon him like a dove. It wasn't a dove, it was like a dove. Then the voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Verse 12, immediately the spirit drove him into the wilderness. What does this sound like? The spirit came upon him. And then what happened immediately after that? Verse 12, we hardly ever read that along with the verses before it. Immediately the spirit drove him, Jesus, into the wilderness. What happens in the wilderness? Jesus is tempted by Satan. He fasts for 40 days. He's ministered to by angels. What does this sound like is happening here? He's being prepared for his ministry to do his part in God's will. So why does Jesus need the Holy Spirit? That's a tough question right there. But remember, Jesus is 100% God and he's 100% man. And to endure what he's going to endure as a man, he needs the Holy Spirit to help prepare him. That's what we're seeing here. This still looks like the Holy Spirit from the Old Testament. So what are we supposed to conclude here? When does this change happen? We think there's a change. It's not just because we interpret the Holy Spirit in the New Testament differently from our point of view. The same prophets that the Holy Spirit came upon in the Old Testament so that they could prophesy to Israel and Judah that they should repent and return to God, those same prophets also prophesied that the work of the Holy Spirit would change. Isaiah said it in Isaiah 44.3. You should write these down. Ezekiel explained it in chapter 36, 27. Zechariah, there's the prophet we're talking about. Zechariah. 12.10 also talks about the new work of the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist describes it in Luke 3.16, not John 3.16, Luke 3.16. And Jesus talks about it in John 14 in the upper room with his disciples on the last night. So we know this change comes. And we've looked at the Holy Spirit from Exodus all the way to the baptism of Jesus, and we still haven't found it. Is it, is it even really important? It is. It's important because the event that happens when the Holy Spirit's work changes is just as important to our salvation as the coming of Jesus Christ. There's one more place we can go in Scripture for a clue. Let's go a few chapters ahead to John chapter 7. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the fourth gospel. Verse 37, Jesus has gone up to the temple. Uh, this is the Feast of the Tabernacles. It's the last feast in the fall, celebrating the end of the harvest season. We read verse 37. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke, this is the Apostle John adding in verse 39, but this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. See, John explains that when Jesus talks about living water flowing out of the hearts of believers, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. Does this sound the same as the Old Testament? No, this is something new. This is different. And when will it happen? John says, not yet, because Jesus hasn't been glorified. Well, when was Jesus glorified? Isn't this the way it always happens when we dig deeply into scripture, we just come upon 
One question after another, more questions. When was Jesus glorified? How did the work of the Holy Spirit change? And what does that mean to us today? Well, to find out, you'll have to stay tuned. Because for the next three weeks, that's where we're going to answer those questions and many others. So pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you and we seek to know you more deeply. As we fall in love with your Holy Spirit, we thank you for your word. That by studying it, we can come to know who he is and what he's done. We don't have to rely on any other source or our own experience to know that he is God, that he is an equal part of your Holy Trinity, and that he is a person. Lord, today we learn about his ministry before you glorified your son, and we look forward to understanding his work today. And I would pray that we would all have open hearts to the work of your Holy Spirit. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.